next talk is by Swami Atmarupananda. We have no dispute with anything. Thank you, Mataji, and uh, glad to be back with you after with you all after the break. Uh, yes, as Mataji said, we have no dispute with anyone is the title, and that's a phrase taken from uh, Godapada, his famous Godapada's uh, Karika. <clears throat> Many of you have heard of that. It's a traditional and very important text on Advaita Vedanta. According to tradition, we don't have any uh, historical document supporting it, but uh, we also don't have anything to negate it. According to tradition, Godapara was the teacher of Shankaracharya's teacher, and Shankaracharya himself met Godapara. Uh, so however that may be, true or untrue, it doesn't matter. His karika is extremely important in uh, the Vedanta philosophy, and a karika means a commentary on a text in verse. And so the, uh, the uh, Godapara Karika in four chapters uh, is begun with a chapter which is a commentary on the Mandukya Upanishad, which Swami Sarvapriyananda referenced uh, this morning. Uh, the shortest of the major Upanishads uh, and the text which deals with the nature of uh, three states of consciousness plus the fourth, which is beyond all states, which is the reality, and Om as symbolizing these three states of consciousness and coming out of the fourth. So the first chapter of Gaudapada's commentary is a com uh, 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 or Karika is a commentary on that Mandukya Upanishad. The other three chapters are actually developing his philosophy of Vedanta. And the fourth chapter, in the beginning of the fourth chapter, he has two interesting statements where the title of this session is taken from. In the second verse, he mentions as part of the verse, I won't mention the whole verse because it takes us into a, 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 an idea that he was um, uh, uh, speaking about, which isn't relevant to the topic right now. He says, Avivadam nibodhata, uh, which translated means, uh, O disciples, or those who are listening uh, to my discourse, my karika, O disciples, uh, understand this philosophy which has no dispute with anyone. That is the Advaita philosophy. Understand this philosophy which has no uh, uh, dispute with anyone. And then in the fifth uh, the uh, fifth verse of that chapter, the chapter has a hundred verses, it's the longest of the four chapters, but the fifth verse, he says, I bow, bow down to that yoga that is well known as free from relationships. Now, the Sanskrit is much more powerful than free from relationships. Uh, it's the yoga which is asparsha yoga. Asparsha yoga means the yoga which is untouched. Uh, the, the yoga which is untouched by anything. Uh, that is, it implies that it's of absolute non-attachment. There are no relationships. There is no contact. There is no, uh, there is no other. There's just the, uh, the reality itself. So I bow down to that yoga that is well known as Asparsha Yoga, or the yoga free from relationships, joyful to all beings, beneficial to all beings, free from disputes, uh, avivara, free from disputes, non-contradictory, aviruddha, uh, and set forth in the scriptures, deshi, uh, deshitaha. Uh, so uh, that again is where I took the idea. Uh, uh, this philosophy has no dispute with anyone from Godapara, who makes that, uh, the, that uh, statement. So I want to develop that a little bit because it's important to understanding Advaita and why Swami Vivekananda made Advaita the harmonizing factor in religious thought itself. Uh, Sri Ramakrishna would often speak about the truth of all religions that Jatumat, uh, Tatupat, as many faiths, so many paths, 
that all religions basically lead towards God and therefore are true. Uh, and so there are some who say that, well, that's, uh, that's, that's all Sri Ramakrishna meant, was that all religions are true, and therefore all religions are equally true. All religions are just true in themselves. We don't need any, uh, anything further. But that's very unsatisfying to just say that, well, all religions are true. They all lead to God. That doesn't tell us much. We may even believe it because we see the mystics of different religious traditions. All of them claim to have experienced God and all of them seem to have experienced some transcendental truth. But it doesn't explain why all religions are true and how one can see all religions are true. Just so that, well, Ramakrishna said they're all true. But uh, again, that's not satisfying. So Swami Vivekananda used to say, and it's actually taken from Sri Ramakrishna himself. There is one place I found where Sri Ramakrishna says himself uh, that the dualistic uh, experience is followed by the qualified monistic experience where you see that God is the whole and I am a part of God. So the dualistic is God and I are separate. God is the creator. I'm the creature. This is familiar to anyone who knows uh, basic uh, Christian theology and um, uh, Jewish uh, theology, though both traditions have a non-dualistic aspect also, but the mainstream theology is that God is the creator, I'm the creature, and I am always the creature. God is always supreme, and I am always under God, and I can never be God. Qualified monism, qualified non-dualism, Vishishtadvaita says that, no, God is the whole, but I'm a part. I'm always eternally a part, but uh, I'm a part of God. My nature is the same nature as God, but I'm like a spark of fire, whereas God is the cosmic raging uh, limitless fire. Uh, so I'm the same nature, but, but small. Uh, and non-dualism says that, no, I am that. I am that reality itself. All sense of separation is uh, an illusion. Uh, I'm the reality itself. So Sri Ramakrishna himself uh, 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 said that there is this ladder of spiritual experience. One begins with this sense, which is the common sense view of religion, that I'm separate from others, I'm separate from God, uh, and I worship God because God is great and I'm small and helpless. Uh, that's, again, is, that's just, that is theology based on common sense perception of the ordinary person. But Vedanta says we have to develop super sense, not common sense. Our common sense is not enough. We have to go beyond that. So again, we come to the point where I begin to see that the soul is of the same nature as God, but it's small, limited, and God is infinite, unlimited. Uh, and then the, the non-dualistic experience where uh, there is no distinction whatsoever. Why is that important? Why is it important to see this ladder of spiritual experience which, which Swami Vivekananda presented uh, as the basis for interreligious understanding? It's important because as Gaudapada says, this is the philosophy which is avivara, without dispute with anyone, aviruddha, which is uh, non-contradictory. What, what does that mean? To use a metaphor, which is often used, and uh, probably all of you are familiar with it, uh, if you take uh, a mountain and the paths up the mountain, uh, the paths are apparently contradictory to each other because they start from different places, they lead by different trajectories up to the top of the mountain. But when you get to the top of the mountain, you see that all of the paths were leading here itself. All of the paths were true. The contradictions between one path and another path was just because of the geography of the mountain. Uh, but all of them led here. Some may be more slowly, some may be more quickly, some might be more difficult, some might be easier. Some might have springs of water along the way where you can rest and uh, refresh yourself with water and maybe a cooling bath. But they all lead to the summit. And so Vedanta is said to be by Ramakrishna and by Vivekananda to be the summit. In non-dualism, you can see from non-dualism the truth of all of the other paths. And you can see that in uh, practical historical terms. 
yes, there have been fanatical Advaitins who didn't want anything to do with any other paths. They had no use for others. They thought that they were superstition. But that's contrary to the larger tradi tradition. Uh, the Vedantin, the, uh, the Vedantin with uh, clear insight and with uh, the knowledge of the highest truth can look and see that all of life, not just the three levels of religious experience, dualism, qualified monism, and non-dualism, but all beings are making their way towards the reality itself. Why? Because they are the reality. They've only forgotten who they are. And forget, forgetfulness can only last so long. Why can forgetfulness only last so long? Because the reality is resplendent. It's the only reality. It's the truth. It is the only and absolute truth, uncontradicted by anything because it is non-dual. Uh, and it is seen to be the nature of everyone and everything, the plant, the animal, the insect, the bacteria, the rock. Everything is a manifestation of this resplendent, luminous reality which nothing can hide. And that's the great mystery. The great mystery that how could the only reality, which is self-luminous, which is self-authenticating, which is unhideable, which is uh, unmistakable, uh, how could that be hidden from us? That is the great mystery. And so Sometimes Maya has been described, like by Shankaracharya in one of his uh, uh, short poems of five verses. He, the, each verse ends with the refrain, Agatita uh, gatana patiyasi, that which makes the impossible possible. Maya is that which makes the impossible possible. It's impossible that that reality could be hidden because it's the only reality. There's no other reality. It's resplendent, it's luminous, self-luminous, self-authenticating again, without contradiction. And yet, and we are that, because it's the only reality, and we are, so we are that reality, and yet we don't see it. One of the strange things uh, that those who have experienced the highest truth say is that when it is realized, one has the experience, not in words, but the, the, the significance of the experience uh, is that this was always the truth. This was always the truth. How did I not see it? How could I not have seen this? It was right there. It was there all the time. Now I see that it was there all the time, but somehow I paid no attention to it. It was the truth even in my deepest ignorance. It was right there, and yet somehow I didn't see it. This is Maya. That which makes the impossible possible. And so we can't, it can't remain hidden forever. It's constantly impinging on our experience right now. In texts like the Laghu Vakya Vritti, a beautiful short text of Advaita Vedanta, it says that between every two thoughts, the light of the self is shining through. That is, it's coming into our experience every moment. And it's that which is leading us on, seeking, seeking, always seeking, looking, looking for our final refuge in relationships with other people, in good food, in uh, beautiful places on earth, in uh, interesting subjects, in so many things. We seek this uh, final resting place because this light is constantly impinging on us between every two thoughts is shining through and calling us on. In the language of uh, Hindu myth, it's the flute of Sri Krishna, the flute that Sri Krishna is playing, uh, that mystifying uh, exquisite music, which is calling the soul forward, seeking, seeking, ever seeking for uh, the, uh, the source of this music which calls us forward. That which does not allow us to be satisfied with anything small, we're constantly trying to find it in small things, limited things, uh, because the music is calling us forward and all that we see 
are small things. All we see are little limited things, little limited experiences. So we keep seeking, trying this, trying that, trying the other thing, and nothing satisfying us. Uh, and uh, so it, it, uh, it calls us forward until finally comes the point where we realize that it's not to be found in any limited experience. As the Chandogya Upanishad uh, beautifully says, Nalpe Sukhamasti. In the small, there is no happiness. And that's true. As Swami Sarvapriyananda said yesterday so beautifully, uh, that even in our so-called happy experiences, there is dissatisfaction. That was the great teaching of the Buddha, as the Swami mentioned yesterday. When Buddha says that sarvam dukkam dukkam, everything is uh, uh, suffering. He didn't mean that there's no happiness, of course. Of course, there are many happy moments in life, many uh, moments in life where we're happy, we're joyful and all of that, and that's good. Vedanta doesn't uh, say there's anything wrong with that. But even those are unsatisfactory. They're not enough. And so, nalpe sukamasti, in the small, there is no satisfaction. There is no happiness. Bhumayeva sukam, the infinite alone is happiness. And so that keeps calling us forward. So we go through dualistic experience when we turn spiritual. Uh, we go from that to qualified monistic experience. We go through that to non-dualistic experience. And some of us may, from the beginning of our path, we may see the beauty of non-dualism and be attracted towards that. And that's fine. The ladder of spiritual experience doesn't mean that, that, that you have to spend a long time on each step. Maybe in past lives, if, if you, no, let me start over. Maybe if you feel an attraction to non-dualism early in your life, uh, your spiritual life here, it may be because the other levels of spiritual experience you had in the past life. That's theoretical, we don't know. And it's not necessary to think that, but maybe. All we know is that some, some of us are attracted to the idea of non-dualism from the beginning of our spiritual path. Uh, and so though there is this lad, natural ladder of spiritual progression, we don't have to start from the beginning if that's not where we feel called to start. If you feel called to non-dualism, start there. Because this path is the path without dispute. Again, let me emphasize, because it's important, that the human mind can become fanatical about anything. I've known people, good people, devoted people, who become Ramakrishna fanatics. Uh, no other spiritual group is any good, only the Ramakrishna order, and uh, it's uh, only the Ramakrishna Swamis, only the Ramakrishna order, only Ramakrishna himself. They are the only things, uh, uh, the only good religious tradition in the world. Everybody else is mistaken. That's contrary to Sri Ramakrishna himself. But the human mind is the human mind. We can become Ramakrishna fanatics, and so we can become Advaita fanatics too that uh, uh, all of these other yogas and all of these other paths are for stupid people that are uh, too emotional or too dumb to understand Advaita. No, no, no. All of the paths are good. All of the paths are good. All of them lead towards uh, the ultimate realization. And even if you don't want the ultimate re realization, that's okay. Follow them as far as you want to go. But someday, someday you will come to the point where the call of the infinite is undeniable and you don't want to be held back from it. Do you think that if you were to come close by worshiping God, you come close to God uh, as a dualist and you see the infinite ocean of God's beauty, the infinite ocean of God's wisdom and consciousness, the infinite ocean of God's immortal existence, the infinite ocean of God's infinite joy, infinite joy without any shadow of sorrow whatsoever. You see that before you and you say, okay, I'm going to stop here. I don't want to go any closer because I, I, I just want to be me. I don't, want to, I don't want to go any closer. No. If you see that ocean in front of you, again, the ocean of infinite beauty, the ocean which is beauty itself. It's not beautiful. It is beauty. 
it's not joyful, it's joy itself. It's not a uh, joy of a long life. It is existence itself, immortality itself. It is consciousness itself, not conscious, but consciousness itself. You see that before you, then you go to dive in. You can't get close enough until you dive in. Again, to quote uh, Rumi, as I did yesterday, uh, or to paraphrase him, <laughs> I wish I could quote him, uh, but I'll par paraphrase it. It's a very short poem of Rumi, uh, where he says, uh, oh, drop, uh, it is only your dropness that separates you from the ocean. Dive into the ocean and there you get the infinite wealth of uh, the ocean itself. By dying to your dropness, you become the ocean. Oh, drop, what a, what a tremendous benefit that is to you that only by sacrificing your littleness, you become the infinite ocean itself. So why not plunge into the ocean and become the ocean of immortal uh, and everlasting uh, richness? So yes, if we come close enough to God through the dualistic path or the qualified monistic path, then there's not a point, there's not a stopping place. We may think so now because we're so, our precious individuality is so precious to us that we can't imagine losing it. But if we get close to that ocean, then that's the first thing we want to lose. We see that all I'm losing is my smallness. All I'm losing is my limitation. All I'm losing is my suffering and my misery. All I'm losing is that which limits me and keeps me back and makes me weak and small and insignificant. That's all I'm losing by diving into the ocean of immortality, becoming the ocean itself. How could I hold myself back when I get to the point where I can see that? I can't. And so from that standpoint, from the standpoint of the ocean, then you see the, uh, how the different rivers of different religions are feeding into the ocean. And you see there's no contradiction. That's why Swami Vivekananda said, and it's an extremely important teaching. It's not often emphasized, but it's extremely important. He said, always remember, we do not travel from error to truth. We travel from truth to truth. That's only possible to say from the standpoint of Advaita, because the lower standpoints don't accept Advaita. The Dvaitas don't accept it. Uh, the qualified monists don't accept it. But from the standpoint of a Dvaita, you can see how everything is just, everything is a coming up. Everything is a growing manifestation of the ultimate truth of a Dvaita. Everything has its place. The uh, drunkard on Skid Row is Brahman himself, Brahman itself, working its way through evolution, through various experience, back towards itself. The murderer is perfect Brahman, trying to find his way back to the, the reality itself through ignorant ways, yes, the ways that hurt other people, yes, but trying, trying to come back to his real nature. That's only possible to see from the standpoint of non-dualism. And so this beautiful philosophy gives you uh, this understanding that no one travels from error to truth. We travel from truth to truth as Swamiji qualifies that, from lower truth to higher truth, if you will, but never from error to truth. Everyone, everyone, even the insect, the worm, the uh, plant, the fungus, everything is seeing the same reality, but painting it in different ways. We all, we're all seeing Brahman, but painting it into the worlds of our choice. We paint the reality. The mind paints the reality. We see it the way that we want to. You may say that, well, I don't want to see the reality I see. I'm miserable. No, there's something within you that is attached to the way that you see the world. Something deeply unconscious, uh, deeply rooted in you, habitual, that won't allow you to be free to see reality as it is. When I was a young, a new brahmachari in Chicago, the Swami in charge at that time, he used to say sometimes that uh, if you wanted to be, uh, if you wanted to realize God, nothing could hold you back. You would realize God right now. And I thought, that is ridiculous. 
I came here to realize God. I'm trying, but I don't know how. So no one is telling me how. I want to know how to realize God. I want to. I don't want to see the world that I see. Now, after years, I understand, yes, I see the world that I wanted to see. I'm attached to the world that I wanted to see with all of its joys and sorrows, its pains and pleasures, uh, because of ignorance. But there's something deeply seated within me that wants this world. And when I can overcome that, when I can want the other, the, the, the truth, and nothing but the truth, then nothing can hold me back from it. That's, uh, again, the value of bhakti, because bhakti brings out uh, the lover in us. And uh, so we begin to love the reality in the form of God, the personal God whom we can relate to. And so we run towards the one that we love. But that can come about in the path of Advaita also, where we begin to see that what I want is existence itself, consciousness itself. Ananda means not just joy, Ananda means joy, yes, bliss. It also means beauty. It also means love. So this is the ocean of infinite love, the ocean of infinite beauty, the ocean of infinite joy, which is consciousness and existence. That's what I want to get to. And so from the standpoint of Advaita, we can see how the person praying to a distant God is coming in the same direction as I'm trying to go in. We can see how the uh, person who uh, is uh, practicing what, whatever religion at whatever level uh, that they practice it in, they're trying to approach the same truth. And we can see again, as I said, how the drunkard, how the murderer, how the thief, how all of them are trying to come to the same truth. And then we have genuine compassion because we see that everyone is the same reality. Everyone is trying to come to the same realization, knowingly or mostly unknowingly. Uh, and yet, because of this tremendous power of uh, ignorance that we suffer from, ignorance, according to Vedanta, not imposed by God, but ignorance, which is forgetfulness. We've somehow forgotten our true nature. And that is Maya. As Swamiji says, Maya is a statement of fact. Maya is not a demon who is keeping us uh, ignorant. Maya is a statement of fact. I've forgotten who I am. Let me remember. And like the person in a dream who tries to remember when they're chased by the tiger in the dream that, oh, I'm dreaming, I'm dreaming. Let me wake up, let me wake up. That's what we need to do. In fact, according to Advaita, that's all we need to do is to wake up. And so all of our practices, all of our struggles, are for that, to wake up. Because the truth is there, and that's who we are. All we have to do is to wake up. Uh, so do whatever you need to do to wake up. Do whatever you need to do to, uh, uh, to uh, come to an, an, a recognition of that which you already are. Let me end, and then we'll take questions. Let me end uh, this uh, uh, session uh, by Again, coming back to what I said at the end of the last, at the end of the last, I didn't have enough time to develop it, and I don't really have time enough to develop it now, but I want to mention it because it's important. Uh, the wonderful path, which was an ancient Upanishadic path, but which was uh, somewhat forgotten for thousands of years until Ramana Maharshi revived it, this path of self-inquiry, who am I? Atma Vichara, self-inquiry, who am I? It's a wonderful path. Uh, it's not at all contradictory to the teachings of Swami Vivekananda or Sri Ramakrishna, uh, but to try to, to do a questioning state of mind, not repeating who am I as a mantra, but just by a questioning state of mind to try to pull back and to uh, pull my awareness back from its objectification, pull it back with the question, who am I? Who is it that thinks these thoughts? Like in the Kena Upanishad. Kena shitam patati pre shitam manaha. Kena prana pratama praiti yuktaha, etc. Who is it that directs this mind? Who is it that directs the pranas? That is, who am I? Who am I? 
Uh, it's a wonderful practice. And the other practice I mentioned is Swami Vivekananda, which is in a sense the opposite, but not in the sense of being contradictory. The two can go together or you can choose one or the other. They're both beautiful. But Swami Vivekananda insisted that we should go from door to door and teach everyone, the sweeper, the street sweeper, the fisherman, the lawyer, the student, the doctor, uh, the a beggar in the street, go from door to door and teach everyone, you are the infinite self. All power is inside of you. All glory is inside of you. The universe itself is inside of you. Now, I've heard people, including our own monks, who say that, well, I, that, how do you do that? Swamiji said it. It must be true, but uh, that's a mysterious thing. But I don't think Swamiji meant actually that we go from door to door like a Jehovah's Witness and knock on people's door and say, have you found your personal savior within your Atman? Uh, no, not, uh, not uh, anything like that. But to make this knowledge accessible to everyone, including to the beggar, including to the street sweeper, the garbage collector, including to the intellectual and to the person who is uh, uh, uneducated as well, that inside of you is all power. The power of the universe is inside of you. Swami Vivekananda says, uh, each soul is potentially divine. The goal is to manifest that divinity within. That's an interesting statement because according to Vedanta and even according to the Swami, you're not potentially divine. You are divine here and now. As he says, the murderer is perfect God here and now, just ignorant of it. So why does he say potential divinity and manifestation of uh, potential divinity? Because it's potential to us because we don't know it. But this idea of manifestation is at the heart of Swami Vivekananda's teaching of non-dualistic Vedanta as a practice. That Manifesting it means, as he said, my ideal can indeed be put in a few words. And that is, he writes this to Sister Nivedita, my ideal can indeed be put into a, uh, a few words. And that is to teach unto mankind their divinity and how to make it manifest in every move movement of life. Once someone told me when I quoted that, oh, no, 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 he must have said in every moment of life. No, he said in every movement of life. In the Atman, there's no movement. There's no body. There's nothing to move. So why did he say to make it manifest in every movement of life? That was his teaching. To teach to everyone that you are the self, the divine self, the infinite one with the, the universe. Manifest that. That is, as long as you experience the world, learn to act on that standpoint, that idea that I am one with the, with the reality itself. All power is inside of me. That is manifesting it here and now in this life. He said it would make a student a better student, a fisherman a better fisherman, a lawyer a better lawyer. And eventually it would help them to realize the highest truth. So that is manifesting that reality here and now. And I'll end by saying that if we take up these ideas of Swami Vivekananda, if we study them and we internalize them, we find that we catch fire. We catch fire with these ideas. They illuminate the heart. And then we find these ideas vibrating within us. And we find that, yes, all strength is inside of me. I can do the impossible. Uh, I can face everything that comes, uh, that comes my way. Because the strength of the universe is here. So, questions, please. Swami, Maya makes the impossible possible. Please explain. <laughs> uh, well, it makes the impossible possible in the, uh, uh, in the sense that I said, so I'll just develop it a little bit because I realize it's difficult to understand. I, I certainly understand that. It was difficult for me to understand. I, uh, uh, it, took, it took years to understand it. But it makes the impossible possible uh, basically means, and this can be spread out into more detail, it means that I am the divine itself. I am one with Brahman. I am Brahman. Not that there's me and Brahman and I just happen to be one with Brahman, like I'm one with my best bro. No, uh, I am Brahman. There's no separation. And yet, I think that I'm Swami Atmarupananda. I think I'm this person with so many limitations, so many weaknesses, uh, so many flaws, uh, so little understanding. 
uh, say, who finds it difficult to think about uh, difficult uh, subjects, who knows so little about uh, so many things. I think that uh, that's who I am. Whereas I'm Brahman, I'm the infinite. I am uh, infinity itself, and I don't see it. That is making the impossible possible. If Brahman is the only reality, and I am Brahman, and Brahman is self-luminous, how could I think that I'm this stupid little Swami Atmarupananda? How could I be so foolish? How can I be so foolish to think that I'm Swami Atmarupananda? That's making the uh, impossible possible. It's impossible that I could not know who I am. And yet I don't. And yet I don't. And yes, you can, of course, extrapolate from that out to uh, a, a, a detailed exp explanation, but that's the basic thing. That's the basic thing. That everything here is God. Everything here is divine. But I see it as dull, dead, and sentient matter. I see it as people wandering around, not knowing what they're doing. Uh, I see it uh, uh, people making bad choices in life and uh, people who are, some people stronger, some who are weaker, the stronger taking advantage of the weaker, uh, people filled with jealousy and all of that. Whereas in truth, everything is Brahman. Everything is Brahman. Why do I see the way that I see? Swami Vivekananda said that uh, the path of Vedanta is to always be subjective, to ask why do I see evil in the world? Not, why is there evil in the world? Why do I see evil in the world? Because if my mind were perfectly pure, I would see nothing but Brahman. It's because my mind is not pure that I don't see things as Brahman. The problem is with me, not with the world. So Maya makes the impossible possible. I know that's hard to understand, but it's it's a truth that you can understand. Swami, what examples of feeling the unity would you point us to to feel that unity more completely? Yes, well, let me... Uh, Brahma Pranadi gave a, a beautiful meditation, and it's uh, very similar to the meditation I give. So let me just develop that a little bit, a uh, little bit more. If you try to feel a sense of unity pervading everything, uh, you know, again, at first you don't know, well, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to imagine like a cloud of light or uh, uh, a, a cloud of glory or something that's pervading everything? No, it's not a question of imagination. It's just sitting quietly and trying to feel, well, first, let me say that as I said, this experience of unity is present every moment within you. You can't perceive anything without there being this per first, this perception of unity. All diversity is founded in this perception of unity, which is there in your experience right now. It's already present. So it's not imagination. It's just being quiet, closing your eyes, and trying to feel that there is with the conviction that uh, yes, I've heard it's there. Let me see if I can feel it. Just try to feel what is actually there, a sense of unity pervading everything. And you can begin to feel with a little bit of effort. On the first, the first session, you can begin to feel a little bit. But yes, I can, I can sort of feel a sense of unity pervading everything. Maybe at the very beginning, I have to use my imagination a little bit but I use it only to stimulate the perception of the actual unity which is there. So I try to feel it. I think about everything around me, my body, my mind, and everything, but that there is a unity pervading all. Once you can feel that a little bit, you try to feel it uh, more, you meditate on that sense of unity more, and it becomes more tangible. Until you open your eyes and you walk around, you're doing things, and you, do, you begin to feel that all of this is taking place within this, uh, this unity. The sense of unity remains. That's not realization, but it's a very helpful thing to, for meditation and to begin to feel that, yes, it's true. There is one reality, and everything here is floating within that reality. One day I'll see the reality itself, what it is that this sense is giving me a sense of. 
But right now I can feel that everything, like as again, as I said, uh, when watching a movie, you watch, uh, you know, when you get absorbed in the movie, you feel that you're going to Spain, you're going from Spain uh, to North Africa, to Morocco, and from there you travel to India. No, it's all right there on the screen, sitting right in front of you, and you're sitting in your seat in the movie theater. You haven't moved. But when you're absorbed in the movie, you feel that you're going to all of these places. Uh, and then you can become conscious of the movie screen. And then you see that, no, it's just the play of light on the movie screen. Now, that, that ruins the movie for you. So don't do it if you want to enjoy the movie. It ruins the movie. But in real life, if you begin to see all of this as just a projection, a play, a play of uh, name and form within this uh, uh, all-pervading unity, then uh, uh, perceiving that unity gives real life to everything. Everything comes alive in a different way. You begin to see a beauty in everything because everything is playing within this higher subtle uh, unity which has the sense of holiness, the sense of purity, the sense of spirituality to it. And so unlike destroying a good movie by looking at the screen. <laughs> in this, you begin to see life itself as a movie. And I, I'll try to end with just one more, uh, one more idea to this because I won't give time for other questions. But uh, in France, I often say this, uh, that we sometimes go to a movie and it's a very, very sad movie. And we weep throughout the movie. It's uh, such a sad movie and we uh, come out and uh, somebody asks, well, how did you enjoy the movie? We say, it was wonderful. I cried for two hours. It was wonderful. Uh, you cried for two, you paid money to go and cry for two hours? And you say, it's wonderful? Yes, because I saw it as a movie. And when I can see this as a movie, then I can begin to see everything in a different perspective, in a larger perspective. Now I have a distance from it, and I can see it as a play. Everything is a, as this cosmic dance, the dance of Shiva, the dance of Krishna, the dance of Kali, the dance of Ramakrishna, whose dance was itself a cosmic dance. Let me, one question, please forgive me if I've misunderstood. Are you suggesting that ultimately no one would want to just eat sugar, but would want to become sugar? <laughs> good question, good question. Uh, now, uh, there, uh, it's an excellent question because I have to qualify what I said, because Sri Ramakrishna himself said that there are those who want to taste sugar, not to become sugar. But I think from Ramakrishna's own other sayings, uh, that that is true up to a point, that there is a point where everyone wants to become sugar. Uh, that he used to say that they're those who want to retain their sense of illumined individuality in, uh, and uh, to, uh, to enter into play with God. And that's a beautiful idea. And if that's what you want, then aim for that. That's very good. I won't say anything against that. Ramakrishna advised that and said that that was an excellent position to take. But one day Sri Ramakrishna asked Swami Vivekananda, what would you do if you were like a fly? and you landed on the brim of a cup, and that cup was filled with uh, nectar, uh, what would you do? And, uh, and Narendra, the future Vivekananda said, I would stand very, very carefully, and careful, careful not to fall in, I would uh, sip the nectar in the cup. And Ramakrishna laughed and said, what you fool? That's the nectar of immortality. By falling into that, you become immortal. So yes, a time will come, whether we enjoy for a long age the the play with uh, the pl play with God. A time will come when yes, now my love has grown so strong that, uh, that nothing can satisfy me but but joining the lover in oneness. Uh, the uh, and there are many there are Sufi poems about that. There are Hindu poems about that. The, the the consummation of love, where love, lover, and beloved become one, as Swami Vivekananda insisted, would happen, where nothing, nothing satisfies but, but uh, jumping into the ocean of immortality. As Swamiji uh, said uh, that, uh, oh, my beloved, the, uh, my love for you is so great that I can have no other name for you but I. Any other name puts you apart. 
So the only name I can have for you, my love is so great, the only name I can give to you is I, because I can't separate myself. Swami, how would we know we're on the right path in meditation? Because the only tool we have is the mind, but Brahman is not perceptible. Yes, that's so true. Uh, that's very true. And so one uh, one thing is uh, to have a teacher that you can uh, you can go to and get advice from. Uh, it's uh, uh, one of the basic ideas within Hinduism, all schools of Hinduism, and it's very much present in uh, Tibetan Buddhism as well, uh, where Lama doesn't mean monk. Lama means guru. And so one's Lama, uh, they have the same attitude towards the Lama that we have towards our Guru. And so a Guru can be of great help in that. But another thing is that as we progress, the mind itself, as it becomes clearer through practice, a time comes when the mind itself begins to guide us. And so it's said that the mind itself becomes our Guru. Holy Mother confirms that, Sri Ramakrishna confirms that, Vivekananda confirms that. So before that happens, to take the help of a spiritual teacher. Just be careful, as Swami Sarvapriyananda explained very well. If you have a teacher from a an authentic, uh, very authentic tradition, uh, then uh, uh, you have more security in taking uh, taking a teacher rather than just picking up a, uh, a a teacher that you find somewhere that you don't know anything about their tradition or background. Uh, but uh, if you have a spiritual teacher, they can be of great help in that. Swami, how can we foster vairagya, renunciation, so that aversion and desire fall naturally away, and maya will lift so that we can experience Brahman? Yes, so that they fall naturally away. That's what is wanted. Uh, desire, the nature of desire is such that if I say, okay, I've understood it now, I'm, so I'm not going to desire anything. I'm going to stop desiring. The very next moment, I start dreaming of chocolate ice cream. Uh, uh, so you can't fight desire. You can't say, I'm not going to desire anything. I, the ego, am not going to desire. The ego is based on desire. It's nourished by desire. And so that ego is claiming to say that I'm not going to desire anything. You can't. So Ramakrishna gave the solution. If you want to get away from the West, all you have to do is to walk towards the East. You don't have to say, oh, I don't want to be in the West. I don't want to be in the West. I don't like the West. I don't like the West. I'm going to stop being in the West. No, <laughs> just turn and walk towards the East. That's all you have to do. So to get away from desire, walk towards God. If you are devotional, walk towards the self. If you are oriented towards the non-dualism. Uh, so don't try to not desire. Of course, you can by understanding the nature of desire and how it gets you into trouble and uh, perpetuates your dissatisfaction. You can simplify your desire and you can extricate yourself from consumer society mentally, at least, if not physically, because then you'd have to be on a different planet. But at least mentally, you can extract, ex, uh, extricate yourself from the consumer society and just uh, simplify your life and simplify your desires. But still, there'll be basic desires. So the desire to eat and to drink and to sleep and uh, to have a house, uh, those, uh, those, that's necessary just to live. So don't worry about those. Uh, just don't multiply your desires. Don't try to think about all of the things that you could have and fantasize about them. To simplify your desires, but the main thing is to move towards spirit, move towards spiritual truth. Swami, are there any noted books on or by Vivekananda that could help light up the fire to manifest the divinity within? Yes, we're publishing one in French in France. <laughs> <laughs> It's available in English, but I've spread through the complete works. Uh, that is, we're, uh, we're extracting all of Swami Vivekananda's California lectures, uh, Southern California and Northern California, but especially the Northern California lectures, uh, because there Swamiji spoke pure fire. It was as if flames of uh, radiant flames of joy were coming and uh, of truth were coming out uh, with his words. Uh, and so read uh, like his three Gita lectures, especially two and three, but one is important as a basis, Gita one, Gita two, Gita three, 
his lecture, Is Vedanta the Future Religion? His lecture, The Soul and God. Uh, his lecture, Buddha's Message to the World. Uh, and several other, uh, oh, The Goal, a beautiful lecture, The Goal. And also The Way to Blessedness. All of these are extraordinary lectures of Swamiji. Uh, uh, and uh, if you have any, any potential kindling within you, your heart, it will catch fire when you read uh, these uh, these uh, lectures of the Swami. Uh, and again, don't just read them for information. Read them slowly and let everything sink in. Let it sink in. Allow yourself to catch fire. 